Oh, welcome, Historic Fort Snellicum Association. We're glad to be here with you today. Uh, here's a, a technology tip for you. So on my little screen that I use to monitor activity while we're, we're on the screen here, uh, I see a very small image of, of me. But if you adjust your screen so it's, it's only showing the speaker, you'll get a big, big view of, of us on screen as well. So uh, you won't be distracted by your own face or, or other faces that we like to see out there in the audience as well. But thank you for inviting us. Uh, we uh, have always enjoyed our experience with the historic Fort Stillicum Association. And yes, we were there at the very beginning providing a gift to uh, Fort Stillicum, his, historic Fort Stillicum Museum when it opened on the first day. Uh, I remember that right, right fresh on the top of my, my mind, uh, sitting outside in, in chairs in the grass in a nice sunny day uh, and the presentations that took place on that day. If you don't know the history of the Stillicum Tribal Cultural Center, I'm going to start by telling you that uh, it was there first before uh, the Fort Silicon Museum, but that's not unusual. When we opened our doors at the Silicon Tribal Cultural Center in 1989, uh, that was we were only the third tribally operated museum in the state of Washington. So museums, they take a lot of work. You guys know that by charging adults $3 to come through the doors at the museum, uh, you don't really make enough money to sustain the operations of a museum that way. So it takes a lot of other work and fundraising activities by the members to make that happen. And we appreciate the collaborative effort because we've done some things on tours through both historic Fort Stillicum, historic town museum, the Fort Lewis Museum, and also the Stillicum Tribal Cultural Center to put things together where people can be on a journey at all of those locations. So thank you for your relationship that really honors uh, the history of the Stillicum tribal people. I am honored to have Cheyenne here, not only because she was my apprentice storyteller, uh, I say 10 years ago, but, but I'll let her correct me because she knows the year, right? When I started storytelling um, and also giving tours at the museum when I was seven, so about 10 years ago. And they, they enjoyed her much more than me, even when they came to the museum. So Cheyenne would tag along and tell them uh, all the stories about the things that we normally charge extra for if you want a guided tour, but who, who knows? I mean, she was seven years old, so she's going to tag along and do it for free, and people, people really appreciated that. But but she has gone out uh, from apprenticeship level to uh, being able to do her own storytelling on out there in the world by herself now. So, so that makes her a, uh, a full-fledged journey level storyteller as well. I call myself a master storyteller, but you know what? Uh, it it kind of takes a world to make you feel like you've mastered that study. Uh, and, and part of that is that you can share that and, and provide training to others. So part of the things that we do is provide training to others in this art of storytelling at the Stillicum Tribal Cultural Center. Hopefully we'll have an event and we welcome everybody to come and attend those. So we're gonna, we're gonna tell you some history today, of course, uh, because uh, that's what the request was, but that history always includes stories as a piece of that. So. Another reason why I'm thankful that Cheyenne can be here to share our offsite stage uh, with you. I also want to honor the Duwamish tribe. So you see our background here today. Uh, these are our, our blankets with the uh, symbol that represents the Duwamish Indian tribe. Uh, these blankets were given to us in a, a very special ceremony as a gift by the Duwamish tribe. Uh, part of that gift, the presentation to us uh, was a request to honor them through the display of those blankets. So we're doing that today. Thank you, Duwamish tribe. Uh, thank you for your gift to the Stillicum tribe. Uh, and thank you for uh, giving a nice background for us today. So 
we started with a land acknowledgement earlier. I want to talk about the Stilicum people and our relationship to the land. So the Stilicum people, and that's what we refer to ourselves as. I, I don't have an issue with Indian or Indian tribe. Officially, we are the Stilicum Indian tribe. But when it comes down to the identity of the Indian people, we really are people and everybody identifies themselves as a person, right? So that's where that comes from. If you look in depth into the background for the names of the tribes and what they mean, it just really genuinely means people. And so Stilicum means people. You are honored to live in a town that also honors the Stilicum people with our name and also the fort was honored with the name of the people from this area as well too. So Stilicum people were placed here a long time ago by the creator. And we have stories that talk about how the creator in his wisdom, when he put his servant, Duke Wabal, who we also call the changer, uh, in charge of going out and placing the people in their places amongst the world, he chose this place for the Stilicum tribe. He chose this place for us to be responsible for as well. The choice to place a people group in an area also came with responsibilities. Uh, the responsibility he gave to us was care for the, the oak trees, you know, that we passed legislation only recently within the last 10 years that protects our our oak groves here in Pierce County. And those are traditional groves of oak trees that were cared for and uh, taken care of by the Stilicum people as well. And the acorn was our responsibility, the, the sustenance that came from that. By the way, don't try to eat acorns. This is your, your science lesson for today. Uh, you can if you want to, but it'll probably make you sick. There's, there's a, an acid within the content of the acorn that if it's not treated properly uh, by boiling it, uh, and that's not the traditional method for the, the tribal people, but if you don't treat it properly, you're gonna get sick when you eat it. Uh, myth, myth buster number one for today, uh, squirrels don't love acorns. Uh, they're their second choice on, on sustenance to get them through the winter. Uh, here in this area, they're gonna gather the seeds from both the, the, the fir trees, uh, limited pines that we have, hemlocks, of course, and even very small seeds from the cedar trees. Smallest of all the evergreen seeds, cedar is, is, is there. So those seeds sustain them for the most part. They'll store up acorns if they need to, but don't be surprised if you see a, a squirrel run past an acorn and leave it. That's not their choice. They know it has to be kind of treated differently before they eat it. Uh, we smash them up. So if you come to the Silicon Tribal Cultural Center, you'll see a, a grinder, a stone grinder there that is used for smashing and grinding those acorns down into a powder. Those, those were then used in soups as more of a thickener than something to uh, add flavor or some kind of protein, although it did have some protein value, but it wasn't, it wasn't picked for that reason. The meat and everything else, the seafood that went into that stew was much more important. Acorn was a piece of it, filled our bellies, kept us, kept us full throughout the winter. Let's talk about that as a part of the land. So in the land, the Silicon people had uh, five villages. Our land, our territory uh, is easier to describe in person. I'm glad I'm here and you're here with me so I can talk to you in, in a language that uh, helps you understand the wide territory, the Silicon tribe, because we can do that with our words much, much easier than we can uh, by putting lines on a map, although that, that can be done, and I'll help you with that as well. But traditional Silicon territory, let's start in the north because that's always a good place to start off in that direction. Uh, but on the north side of Silicon, if you were to walk out to the coast of the Sound and stand there, uh, you would be standing uh, on Day Island. Day Island on a map also extends to the east on a street we call 19th Street now. 
here's some interesting points of reference for you. Uh, that also uh, is a border for the county and the city where the un unincorporated Pierce County joins the city of Tacoma. So interesting, you'll see how some of these things match up. Our official government identified markers kind of follow the traditional tribal markers as well. But if you were to stand there at Bay Island and point out towards Snake Lake, that would be the next geographic point of reference for you. Snake Lake, straight line. And then if you were to journey across the Snake Lake and point to Mount Rainier up to the top, you would say everything on that side of that line belongs or is, is an area that, that, that is responsible, that the Puyallup tribe is responsible for. Everything on the other side, the south side, is area that the Silicon tribe is responsible for. Now that doesn't go forever and perpetuously down to the end of the earth. That does go for a long ways though. So more than a day's journey on foot, uh, if you were to travel to the south side, a little bit easier to define for us because there's a waterway there. And, and we recognize that changes, right? The flow of water changes over time. So it's not always the same, but that waterway was the marker for the Stilicum tribe and the Nisqually tribe. So on the south side of the Stilicum tribe, uh, follow the sound out to the mouth of the Nisqually River. The Nisqually River, everything to the north of the Nisqually River, Stilicum, everything to the south of the Nisqually River, Nisqually Indian tribe. That was pretty simple. Now here's your other geographic point of reference. The border between Pierce County and Thurston County, same marker as the traditional border between Nisqually and Stilicum tribe. So government continued to follow the traditional practices of the Stilicum people. Within our territory, Dukwabal, when he rested of his journey across the land, Part of, the, part of the history of that story is that, that he was tired from flying out there and placing people across the world. And when he got to the Puget Sound, he realized what a fantastic place it was. We know that because we're here, right? Not just us, the Silicon Tribe, but all of you as well. Uh, we know how fantastic the Puget Sound is. Well, when Dukeval got here, he was surprised. He said, whoa, I think I'll take a rest. I'm gonna empty my basket out, all the rest of the people, I'm just dropping off right here. Uh, and that's why we ended up with so many tribes on the Puget Sound. And not only so many tribes, historically over a hundred tribes, unique Indian tribes, all speaking a unique language to their tribe here in Puget Sound. Uh, so that language is another important piece of that. Each of the tribes have their own unique language. Can we speak with each other? Yes. Uh, and today, uh, reinstitution of the language practice comes through Lashutse language, which is a general Puget Sound Salish language that people can use to converse with each other. But the, the nuances that make up the unique languages for each of those tribes, most of those have been lost. That's the sad side of what happened to to us in the territory. Uh, within the territory of Silicon Tribe, there were five villages, permanent villages. People would travel around within that area, hunt and gather fish. Uh, but, but there were five villages that were occupied year round within the Silicon Territory. And we know that it was a village, a permanent village, because it was occupied by a structure. Uh, we call those longhouses. And uh, a Silicon longhouse one or two would have been present, maybe more, but probably one or two uh, because of the size of our tribe. One or two of those longhouses would have been present in each of those villages. Are they there any longer? No. Do we have a story to, to share about the location of those longhouses? We know from archeology, span the village sites, but we don't have historical knowledge to share about the longhouses. That's also about the relationship between the tribal people 
and the new people that came into the land because uh, the government's initial goal and plan for the tribes were to exterminate the people. Uh, if they could not exterminate them and if they could build a relationship that was sociable, then they would do that, but it would be through the el elimination of their culture and identity as Indian people. That was a plan called assimilation, assimilate the Indian people so they became another one of the great pieces of the melting pot we call America, which we know doesn't work, right? Anybody who's here in America from another culture, even from a distant land, continues to hang on to their cultural identity, the things that they bring with them. Uh, so we are unique within that melting pot. Yes, the Indian people are all dual citizens of two nations, a tribal nation and a United States nation as well, uh, and honor that relationship. That is the history of our relationship with the new people when they first came into the land. That was a relationship that was built on the fact that we don't own the land, we're responsible for the land. We're responsible for caring for the, all the elements of the land here. You honor us with your presence through coming and sharing that responsibility. Uh, the people were more than willing to have others come and share in that responsibility. Some of those honors and, and promises that were made, especially those in the treaty, haven't always been fulfilled. But we want to tell you a story now, a story about uh, that time leading up to uh, the sorting out of the people and the tribes and their languages uh, when the world was much different than it is today. So, a long time ago, the land was much different. In fact, it was so different. Tell me about where the clouds were at that time. Today, the clouds are up in the sky, but Originally, they were so low and so filled and heavy with rain that they would push down on the people's backs and made them have to walk like this. And everything was soggy and the ground was just mud and everyone was uncomfortable and grumpy. <sighs> and they couldn't even see each other when they would walk. So they'd walk around and they'd <coughs> <into each> other, <laughs> and they couldn't even communicate. There was no language. So they'd just grunt and move away. As you can imagine, that wasn't a very good time. In fact, we call the people from that time the grumpies. That was a good name for them. That's all they could do is grump about everything. But thankfully, uh, things don't go on like that forever, right? If you get down a little bit lower, maybe it's no, not so hard to straighten your back out. And there was, believe it or not, a, a little girl who decided to create the first canoe because she did that from down low and do something about correcting the placement of the clouds and the impact that that had on the people in the world. So she decided to make the first canoe and start traveling around the sound to help people figure out what to do. And during that travel, she discovered that if she pushed on the clouds, they went up a little bit. But the bad part was every time she pushed up in one spot, it would go down ah. in another spot. So she couldn't, she couldn't push them completely into the sky. And to fix this, she started trying to teach other people how to push as well. Traveling around the water, she didn't have any way to communicate with them because nobody understood each other. Uh, and she had to try and demonstrate that process every time she went somewhere. So she would meet a group of people out there and we're going to ask you to try and help us see if you can understand this. No words. You can't understand what I'm saying, really. But here's what we're trying to do. Yes, yes, so you see what happens, but, but here now, while we're pushing the clouds up here, the people over there on the other side of the, of the sound, they were all getting it smashing down on them again. 
that happened for a while. She went back and forth and showed people how to do that. And, and part of what happened was uh, they started making some little holes in the clouds as well. These little holes started appearing and there were some deer that were being hunted one day by some hunters. They discovered the holes and they actually traveled up into the cloud world and the hunters traveled after them, chasing them as well. We'll hear more about them later. So what was her next big idea? Well, since it was a language, she started to try to develop a way to communicate. And the way she tried that was by creating a word. And this word is aho, which today is used as a greeting. Um, but then she used it as a sort of symbol, not symbol, um, a, um, what's the word? A tool. A tool to help everyone know when to push up on the cloud so they could work together. So she traveled around again, and this time she began getting a group of people that all work together. She would say, now, when we push, I want you to all push together at the same time. Follow me as I say, ah, ho, and we all push together. And so she got people doing that, but it was people all across the sound, and they began to work together as a team. And not only that, she had already made her first canoe paddle so she could sail around in, in the water and get from place to place. And she discovered that she could push the clouds even further if she used her canoe paddle to push. So she said, grab a stick, grab anything, get a hold of something. Now, I want us to all try together here and see what we can do if we're all working together. And so everybody grabbed an implement of some kind. She had her canoe paddle, we had sticks, we had clubs. We were now starting to build long houses out of tall logs, but we could do this if we all work together. So we all grabbed a hold of something and we said, now get ready, uh ho and Believe it or not, the clouds were all pushed way up. It, there was so much power behind all the people working together that the clouds shot up into the atmosphere to a place they'd never been before. Remember those hunters and the deer? You can still see them up there. So if you go out into the night sky and see the Big Dipper, you'll see those three hunters with their little dog chasing some deer at the end down there. And they're still up there in the sky, even till today. So that we think of as kind of the first big change in the world. There's another one that took place as well, because uh, a long time ago, uh, our relationship with the land was much different. Our relationship with the animals in the land were much different. And the relationship between the animals and the animals were much different as well. Uh, you see uh, wolves hunting deer, uh, not so much in, the case, in, in that time. These people were like their own tribes. We had the deer tribe, the wolf tribe, and the bear tribe, but they all lived together and worked together as much as they could. Uh, we used to be able to communicate much more closely with the animals. And we have stories that talk about our communication and being able to talk with the animals. But the animals used to be able to share a language of communication as well. And so we want to tell you about another time that has changed in the world. But this time is a time where all the animals were working as independent tribes in a place that was much different than it is today probably much more significant than we think about. Because do you know that Blackberry used to be a tree? In fact, he was one of the most um, loved trees known. And he was also very, very friendly. And on really hot days, animals would come and rest in his shade and eat his blackberries and everyone got along really, really well. But eventually, Blackberry grew very jealous of the cedar tree because everyone would come to cedar for clothing and long houses and um, canoes, but, but this made Blackberry envious. 
and he decided that he wanted to be more powerful than cedar and to do this every time an animal would come up to him instead of giving them his, his blackberries he would grab them and strangle them and they would die and they, they, they would fertilize his roots until he grew and grew and grew more and more powerful and he even grew thorns that we know about today and would use those to attack as well so as blackberry began to get bigger and stronger and think he was the most toughest and and powerful tree in the land now the animals decided that they had to do something about that right they liked the old days when they could sit under the branches of blackberry and and enjoy his fruit uh, and now nobody could come close to Blackberry. In fact, because his arms had grown so long and the thorns were so tough, they could actually snag somebody from a long distance off and drag them in uh, to create more power for Blackberry. So, and instead of just avoiding Blackberry, they thought we should do something and they called a meeting, just like you guys are having today a meeting of the people. They invited all the animals to come from across the land to join this big discussion of what they could do about blackberry. Should I tell about bear first? Yes. All right. So in the meeting, you had one guy, of course, that thought he had the answer to everything. That was bear. Oh, you can all rest in peace now because i am here and i know the answer to our problem i am of course the strongest and biggest and toughest of all the animals and it should be my responsibility and i can take care of this on my own so i'll go out and knock blackberry down and then come back and let you know that I've trampled him into the dirt. So that's what he did. He headed out. <laughs> Bear was stomping up the blackberry, getting ready to do his worst. And the closer he got, the more blackberry had reached out and started scratching him. And, Black and Bear was just moving as fast as he could, which wasn't very fast. But the closer he got, the more blood he lost because his skin was getting so scratched up. No matter how thick his fur was, he was losing too much blood and he was losing his energy and he had to turn around and go back in defeat. And he reported back to the meeting. I have disgraced the people. I have failed. And after Bear returned, rabbit came up to him and she said of course you couldn't do it you might be fast and you know you might be strong but you're slow i'm fast and i don't have to be super big and strong to get to blackberry i'm gonna run right past all of his thorns and then i'm gonna gnaw through his roots and he'll die and we'll, the people will be safe oh uh, yes rabbit In her plan and she darted through Blackberry's branches and he tried to grab her and it irritated him because at first he couldn't but she was so small that all it took was one whack <laughs> and she plopped right into a river and returned back to the other animals soaking wet and embarrassed so elk had been patiently waking, waiting in the background through all this. And now he stepped forward and said, of course, we have strength and speed and wisdom. All of those are present in me, elk, the wisest of all the animals. But one other thing I have that you don't have these strong, mighty antlers on the top of my head. And I will use my speed and my strength to get in close. But at the same time, 
I'll use my mighty antlers to strike the branches off of Blackberry until I can get close enough to push him down and trample him into the dirt. So Elk set off on his journey, charged in as fast as he could, running this way and that way and dodging the, the arms of Blackberries. They came at him and using his antlers to knock their arms off. And Blackberry's branches started to break and fall across the land. But there were so many of the branches, they started striking elk as well. And elk started losing too much blood, just like Bear had. And he had to stop, especially because he felt like his antlers were about ready to be pulled right off the top of his head. And he didn't want that to happen. So he turned and went back to the other animals and shared, how I too have failed. I have no idea what we can do. At that moment, Eagle, who had been lurking around watching, flew into the center of the meeting and said, all right, you all have your individual strengths, but Blackberry can see you coming. I will take him by surprise and fly in from above and rip his branches off one by one until he's nothing. Hey, Eagle! All right, let's see how this works. Eagle dove in and frightened Blackberry at first He didn't because he didn't see him coming and grabbed off his branches and then flew away and came back and flew away from every direction. And it was working and he was very excited. But every time the eagle grabbed one of the branches, the thorns would tangle with his feathers and it was getting harder and harder to fly until eagle had to give up. Eagle flew back and reported that he had failed as well. But all was not lost. Wolf, one of the greatest minds of all the animal people, we call him Spelei. He was waiting and said, I may not be the strongest. I may not be the fastest, although I am very fast. I'll challenge you to a race any day, rabbit. I may not be the wisest, but I am very wise because I've come up with a plan that will all work for everybody. I may not be able to fly, Eagle, but the magic is that we have to all work together. Here is the plan. We'll wait just before sundown when the sun is going down in the west. And at that time, I will have Eagle fly me up onto the top of the cedar tree on the other side of Blackberry. Then, while I am waiting for my time to, to take place, I will have bear attack from one side and rabbit, you can ride on the antlers of elk and come in chanting your best war song ever and distract Blackberry. Then I will attack from the side that Blackberry can't see. So with the plan in place and sun just about ready to go down, Eagle flew Wolf with his club up into the top of the tree and Black Bear got ready. He came in and he stomped forward, ah, let out one big growl and then laid down to hibernate just out of the reach of Blackberry. This angered Blackberry so much because no matter how hard he strained, he just couldn't grab a bear. And at that moment from the other side, Rabbit climbed on top of Elk's antlers and they charged around Blackberry singing. <laughs> and Blackberry couldn't get them either. And he was angered by Bear on one side and Rabbit and Elk on the other side. And at exactly the moment that he was distracted by them and the sun was in just the right place. Spelei jumped across off of Cedar and onto Blackberry and ah! took his club and... <laughs> broke Blackberry into splinters. From the top to the bottom, all of Blackberry's vines and his arms and his branches were scattered across the earth. And Blackberry was never allowed to be a tree again as punishment for the pain that he caused. But he does continue to grow today 
as a bush. Very um, strong. Very hard to get rid of. Even if you try to get rid of him, <laughs> he grows right back. Um, but he has become a lot kinder, more like who he used to be. And he'll let birds sometimes nest in between his branches. And if he's feeling very kind, he'll let you pick some of his blackberries as well. So thank you, Cheyenne. And you can stay here and, and share more if I forget anything about the history. But we're going to talk to you a little bit now about the world after that time. Uh, the the Stilicum people were here uh, living on land that they cared deeply for. And in retrospect, you have to remember that the land cared deeply for the people as well. And well, it was a symbiotic relationship. We took care of the land, the land took care of us. Uh, expected that that would happen that way for the rest of eternity. Uh, new people came to the land. The new people uh, uh, had needs as well. In fact, most of them came to the, to the land without the ability to survive. And so our people helped them learn how to build that symbiotic relationship with the land as well and to uh, live within the land. Uh, that, that allowed us to have great relationships. The greatest strength that the people had was their relationships with other people, whether it was from the tribal people to the north and the south, uh, or the new people that came to share responsibility for the land. That again was a, a point in the world where we thought things were working well and they would always be that way. Uh, but we know from looking at history uh, that that was just the beginning because uh, of what we refer to today, a negative term that may or may not be such is colonization. The, the plan of the United States was to colonize the entire country, to open it up and, and make it available for people to come and own their own land and to live and to prosper uh, wherever they wanted to in the country. Uh, this was not an idea that was uh, fathomable by, by the tribal people, uh, but it was something that we could relate to because of the relationships that we had with the people. So as the people came and they began that process to, to occupy the land, they also decided that it was important that there be treaties written with the tribes to uh, govern that relationship. Number one uh, promise within the treaty was the right for the people to continue to hunt and gather the fish, the cedar bark, the berries, all the things we normally gathered from now until forever. Uh, in exchange, we would allow other people to come and take up residence within our land. We would, allow, we would be able to build relationships with new people and work together to care for the land. That seemed like a good trade at the time. Uh, there were promises that were made in the, in the treaty that were not kept though. So Medicine Creek Treaty signed in the middle of winter on December 26, 1854. Uh, people from all over the sound uh, at the invitation of, of Isaac Stevens, who was the territorial governor and negotiator of the treaties and had a mission from the president of the United States to get all of the Indian people in the territory. And remember, we had Oregon territory and Washington was just identified as its own territory within that. But within that Washington territory, let's get all the Indian people to sign off on ownership of the land so we could begin uh, occupying it uh, with United States citizens. His first attempt was the Medicine Creek Treaty, ver very first treaty signed on Puget Sound. His, his uh, goal to get all the Indian people there, not so successful. Uh, not only was it the middle of winter, but it was also in a very marshy part of the, of the Nisqually uh, Flats where the people met, right on the border between the, the Nisqually and Silicon tribe. Uh, and so that was a good place as far as Nisqually and, and Silicon were considered, but 
you couldn't expect for all the people to come there in the middle of winter and 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 camp out and wait for whatever this big event was unless of course there was another offer that came along with that a free blanket ah oh, that seemed like a good idea uh blankets were very high valued uh within the puget sound uh these blankets from the duwamish tribe have multiple meanings it's wool and 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 all of our blankets came from wool uh, but those blankets uh, took a lot of time and energy to create for the people if you can imagine traveling the hills collecting the wool left by the mountain goats on the trees that got scattered as they scratched themselves and then turning that into a blanket that took a lot of effort to make that happen there was a period of time where we actually raised some dogs uh, which are extinct now but the woolly dogs were used to shear their hair off and and would be mixed with the mountain goat wool as well uh, to create these blankets but an offer of a blanket was very significant hudson's bay company uh the the british they were here before the americans they they knew the value of blankets and in fact they had started manufacturing mini blankets called not many like M-I-N-I, -I, but M-A-N-Y, many, a lot of blankets uh, that were uh, a uh, had a, a value assigned to them. If you can find a traditional Hudson's Bay blanket, uh, look for a marking up on the side in one corner, uh, not on these, but, but on a traditional Hudson's Bay blanket, uh, based on the size of that blanket, it would be marked and you would identify the value in beaver pelt that that bank, uh, blanket was was had a trade for uh, important at the time not as much now who cares so much about beavers as they did back then uh, you got to put all this into perspective of timing here uh, Abraham Lincoln was wearing his stovetop hat which was made out of beaver skins he wasn't the first to wear that in Europe uh, beaver skin hats were very popular beaver skins at a high value. And this was the place to get them here in Washington, Oregon territory. So Hudson's Bay, Blank Hudson's Bay blankets had already been introduced. People knew about blankets. They loved those. They could get a blanket, they would come. So they did. Uh, treaty was signed, a uh, promise to the Silicon tribe. And all the tribes who signed that treaty is that they would still in addition to be able to hunt and fish and gather as they had, be able to have land in their traditional area. And in fact, all the tribes were promised a, a reservation of their own for their own tribe. Ridiculous. They had never intended for that to be the case. And in fact, uh, the initial result of the treaty was only three reservations for a multitude of about 20 tribes who had been present for the signing of the treaty and uh, had been promised their own land. That ended up in a period that we call the Indian War period. Uh, people were not happy with the, the results of the treaty. Uh, again, promises were made. Uh, Fort Silicon played an important part of that, uh, not only in, in friendship and honor of, of the people, the people and the new people, in their relationship together, uh, but also uh, in uh, helping the tribal people to uh, be protected and, and, and away from what may have happened as, as far as some skirmishes and war, because there were people on both sides that were actually uh, angry and, and, and uh, inflicting harm on others. Uh, Fox Island was, was established temporarily as the Silicon Indian Reservation, uh, but that was only a temporary reservation uh, that uh, tribes from, from all over the Sound were able to uh, shelter at, uh, or at least to be there long enough where we planted crops, uh, long history of that, that piece. Uh, but there was a, a council that took place there at the end of the of the war as well called, called the Fox Island Treaty Council that that council again there was promises made 
and, and specifically to a leader from the Silicon tribe by the name of Sam Young. He had uh, another name that you can find on the treaty, uh, but Sam uh, was the leader. That was what he was known, uh, his, his speaking name between uh, people. Uh, he spoke up and, and had the, the support of all the other tribes in the promise that yes, the Silicon tribe would have land in their own area. Again, that work was not to take place, but the, the history that goes on from there is one where our tribal people uh, without a reservation have continued on. How did we do that? Mostly because in addition to satisfying the tribes with uh, offer of a reservation, a piece of land that would be reserved specifically for them, uh, they were also given the ability to go back and continue living in their villages. Nobody wanted those pieces of land anyways, because they were already occupied. Generally, the people that were coming into the land were looking at un or unoccupied places. They definitely were not saying, hey, let's kick the Indians out of their villages and take that land over. That's not what was happening. Uh, so the tribal people did go back to their villages, but, but this was a, an area that was growing pretty quickly. Uh, Stillicum gets credit for being the first American town. Your fort, Fort Stillicum, first American fort here. A lot of changes were taking place very quickly here and including up until the 1900s when uh, again, the tribe Stillicum was impacted by uh, a, another change in the land. And that's because the, the people in Pierce County decided they were gonna donate land to be used as a military base. Uh, in our area. And so a lot of our village space, again, uh, was taken from the people who had gone back and settled and, and actually even created homesteads within land that was taken as a part of that process to establish Fort Lewis uh, when it was first set up. So I encourage you to, here's a, your tip of geography uh, for the day again. Uh, pull out a map if you can at some point and look at the footprint of the military base that we identify as Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, the size and capacity of that military base will dumbfound you if you have not seen how much space it occupies. Bigger than the entire incorporated city of Tacoma, city of Olympia, city of Puyallup, town of Stillicum, you put them all together, it's smaller than the amount of space taken up by Joint Base Lewis McCord. So big changes again. Uh, what does that mean for today? Silicon Tribe, thankfully, has been able to survive as a strong people because we were not a part of a reservation that had also a very negative impact on the people that lived uh, on the reservation. Our people continued to thrive and live close to each other. Uh, even as we uh, recorded our history into the uh, 1980s, uh, we did a survey that identified that at least 60% of the Silicon tribal people still live close by each other within Pierce County in our traditional area. Uh, as you can imagine, though, our people, uh, for whatever has caused us to move across the land, just like everybody else, have been transported across the world. We've got people that were drafted in the military for World War I and World War II. Those veterans have, have placed, ended up with people placed as far away as Alaska, uh, which even my grandmother's brother served in Alaska in World War I, but, but New York City and New Jersey across, across the country. So we do have people in other places as well. Today, the Silicon Tribe is a treaty signing historical tribe that has continued to exist from a long time ago until today. Uh, and uh, our presence has been strengthened by the resolve of our people, the tenacity to uh, maintain the rights and privileges that we have. We are doing much better at that now. Stronger, be not, we have done one major thing that, that I am proud of here in the last year, and that's to, 
take away this negative label that the federal government has assigned to the Silicon Tribe. It, you, you'll look for a list within the federal government and there are federally recognized tribes and then there are the others. And we're not on that others list under our own placement anymore. Uh, we signed a treaty just like the other tribes that are on the federally recognized side. The only difference is that the government decided to use the creation of reservations as a way to identify who was federally recognized. In the process, recreating even the tribes that are present today. Uh, many of the tribes within Washington territory uh, are tribes that uh, exist uh, because of the people who lived on those reservations and, and, and are now identified uh, as that tribe. I'll name just a few. The largest reservation in Washington territory is the Colville Reservation. And if you look at the name, they even identify themselves as the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Many tribes represent that. That's not the Colville Indian tribe. That's the Colville Reservation. The Tulalip Tribes Incorporated, very large reservation as well, made up of other tribes, not Tulalip. Uh, Squawks and Island Tribe that came about as a result of the uh, Medicine Creek Treaty is not a historical tribe. That, Nobody lived on Squawks and Island. That was not a, a, a tribal village. That was a place that people went to for gathering. But uh, Squawks and Island tribe today is recognized, but the tribes that make up Squawks and Island tribe are still important. I had the honor of meeting somebody in a, a recent panel we did on the Medicine Creek Treaty uh, from uh, the Squawks and Island tribe who identified herself as a descendant from the Tepeaks and people. That was very emotional for me because unlike the Silicon tribe, the T Peaks and people cannot be identified other than their relationship to the Squawks and Island Reservation today. I respect her ability to share that and, and to identify her ancestors from that tribe that's pretty much been erased other than its connection to the Squawks and Island Reservation. That hurts me. I, I can imagine a place where the Silicon tribe might have received the same thing. We've been respected as a tribe of strong people, and there's some history that goes around that in our relationship with the other tribes uh, as well. Uh, we thank you for uh, giving us an honor to present today. Anything you want to add, Cheyenne? Um, just that I had fun telling you some stories. And I am not close enough to the screen to see any questions, but I think that Charlotte uh, has been watching to see if anybody has any questions for us and if you haven't had an opportunity to type those in yet and have a question that you would like to ask i'm going to leave it to you to decide walter how much time we have well let's well first of all uh, i just wish we could be all in one room and applauding you i hope you all can join me just those of you who are on camera we want to give you an ovation and at some point we're going to have you in a room Cheyenne and danny and we'll we'll honor you for this this was absolutely fascinating uh, just absolutely fascinating. And I think I'm probably not the only person who wondered how many times I have behaved like bear. Uh, <laughs> I try not to be distracted by that. Okay. Um, one, just because you kind of, we ended on this point, Danny, and I thought it might be a good segue to this question. Someone asked, you kind of spoke to this, but maybe expanding a little bit more. I know it can get complicated, but someone said, do the Stilicum people have a designated reservation attached to their treaty? Where and how large? Good question. You would think we would, right? Uh, one of the first things that I think most people are amazed by is that a tribal government can sign a treaty with the United States government that has a promise for a reservation uh, and then be denied that, and including being denied an identity uh, within the federal government process because of not having a reservation. Silicon Tribe officially does not have a reservation. We do own property. Can we call it that? We have sometimes. So the Silicon Tribal Cultural Center, which is one lot within the town of Silicon, is the Silicon Indian Reservation. Is it attached to the treaty? No, it is such that tribal reservations are considered trust land that are kept in trust on behalf of the tribe by the United States government. 
So there is a process that you go through, even for tribes. There are, there are seven tribes. I'm sorry, you, you, one of the things you'll learn from me is that, that I've always got a long answer to a short question. <laughs> and so I'm gonna give you a little bit more history and knowledge at, in the, at the same time. But there were seven tribes that have been fighting for that, uh, the, the official identity uh, that they deserve and, and are owed from the United States. Uh, Stillicum, Duwamish, Chinook, and Snohomish are still fighting that case. Uh, and in addition, the three other tribes that were a part of that initial team were the Samish tribe, the Snoqualmie tribe, and the Cowlitz tribe. All, all three of those, Samish, Snoqualmie, and Cowlitz, have uh, gotten to the other side of that process and have also gotten land that has been put in trust status and could be considered uh, a, a reservation uh, connected to their tree. Um, was there a second part to that, Charlotte? About oh, um, there was a where and how large, but I think you- Oh, okay, just, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, the, here's a good question for Cheyenne also. What were some of the first things you learned to become a storyteller? How did you practice and learn? And what are some of your favorite parts of being a storyteller or toughest parts? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, what was the first part of that question? So I can. Yeah, sorry, it's kind of long. The first part was what were some of the first things you learned to become a storyteller and how did you practice? Well, really, it just started with hearing the stories. Um, and that came from my wonderful grandfather and um, just um, how I practiced was, was just by doing. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, like there were, we practiced together and um, I think, I think my, probably my first time that I would told stories to a group was probably the, the was it the third graders? The third graders at, at Charles Wright when I was seven, um, we gave them a tour and uh, ended with storytelling and that was probably my first time um, doing it in front of the whole group. Um, and they were amazed because, because what grade were you in at that time? I think you were- I was second grade. Yeah, second grade. So this is a second grader telling stories to third graders. Uh, I, I will say this, that, and, and so I hoped that my, my other granddaughter, who's, who's now seven, uh, was going to join us today, but she, she got a little bit of stage fright. Uh, so, so she is not ready yet, but, but especially I, I'm going to miss that, you know, Cheyenne is getting ready to graduate and, and maybe even leaving the state, uh, as she continues college. And, and so I'm going to miss my partnership with her. So I'm hoping I can build that other one up as we go. But one of the things that they learn really early is that in order to be a storyteller, you have to make the story your own. And so you can't be afraid to uh, actually change it a little bit. And, and so I would say this because some of you may have heard one or two of those stories from us before, and you will realize that if you did hear them before, it's not the same story, is it? And so it's, it may be a little bit different than the last time you heard it because the storyteller really is somebody who works with their audience and, and puts into the energy they put into that comes from, from their heart. It, the knowledge of what they're sharing is important, but the, the actual words that they use are their own. Great, thank you. Um, Danny, you know my dad. I was as you guys were talking, I was thinking about my sister and my younger my sister and I and our relationship sounds very similar to your guys's. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, this is kind of a big one, and I think it's interesting. I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Um, Danny, this person is asking how you learned the impacts of colonization as a child, and they actually say, um, did your mother, who was also of course a great Silicon leader tell you everything at once, or did you learn it over time? How did you come to understand the, the gravity, I guess, of the situation? It's a sad story, right? Because 
there's not a lot of positive that goes along with that. And so part of part of building the knowledge and the way it was transmitted to me was how do we make good out of out of the history that wasn't necessarily uh, good to begin with. And so that started in one place. Uh, we we haven't always had the Stilicum Tribal Cultural Center to, to, to share our culture, our history, and the knowledge with, with other people. And so before that, we used to have to travel around to do presentations. And boy, they didn't even have computers back in those days, you guys. So, so it's not like, I mean, we're, we're earlier than, there's no cell phones, there's no Zoom, of course, because and there's no computer. So basically, sharing information was was done by one visit at a time. And, and I think the very first time that my mother sent me out to do this on my own, uh, I, I went to a classroom and uh, I was seated in a, a, a student desk, much like you see the desks, the, the chairs and the desktop, a regular school student desk. I was seated in the desk waiting for the classroom to come in. This probably was a class of junior high students, but I was just sitting there and, and I have to tell you another piece too that, that will help you make some context sense out of this, but, but people were coming in and they started asking the teacher, uh, I thought we were gonna have an Indian here with us today. I thought there was gonna be an Indian coming to the classroom today. And I was sitting there already, so I'm hearing all this discussion. And so, so basically, Part of colonization was helping people understand the idea that yes, much has been taken away from the, the tribal people. I learned what we lost. I learned the pain that my grandmother went through personally from her as she was, she talked about how as a little girl, she was beaten by other kids in the school ground, on the school playground for speaking as an Indian or just for being an Indian. And that was okay. That was promoted by the teachers because the teachers didn't allow the kids to speak their language. Uh, and, and so it was okay to pick on an Indian kid because they had to learn their place. So I knew that. I, I knew that, that for me, my identity of who I was came from within. Uh, how did I portray that to a bunch of junior high students? Uh, my question to them was, what does an Indian look like? And so we began the discussion with that. But part of that was, and, and here's the context for you. I didn't always have my hair long, uh, which, which identifies me probably much more so and uh, kind of builds my features as a Native American as well. But, but that came up, up, up again, another soft place for me, my mother and, and the relationship. And, and if you know, she, she became ill. And, and when she died, that was pretty, pretty impactful. Uh, but when I heard about her illness and that she was going through that process, so that's when I stopped cutting my hair. If you know the tradition for Indian people, they only cut their hair at the, at when, when they're in mourning. And if something has happened that has impacted them that way. So I could have grown up always growing my hair. I didn't. And there was a reason for that. I was a rebel and I basically wanted to show people I didn't have to have long hair to be an Indian. And that was my mission to begin with. Later on, it became more personal for me. And so, so my identity now and, and, and caring for how I carry that in the world is much different than it was back then. But how did I learn about colonization? It was more about the impact and, and what are we gonna do about it was the thing. And so we, we shared that in classrooms. We, we set a goal to have our own place that people could come and learn learn about the history of the Silicon tribe and know that it was more than, than what they'd been taught in the, in the textbooks and what they'd seen in the movies and, and how things have been portrayed. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have one more question, a little bit more broad, and it is, what has been the historic relationship between Vancouver Island tribes and South Puget Sound tribes? <laughs> okay, so you know what? Vancouver Island, that's a long ways off. I, you know, I, I can imagine because we've done that, right? Because the canoe journey is a new thing that, that the tribes are, are doing to bring back that piece of the culture now. And so we've done some of those trips, but even the, the Stillicum canoe that we traveled to the Northeast corner of Vancouver Island in, that's not a canoe that was designed to be 
out on the open waters and going across Hood's Canal with those big ships that had come across there at the same time. And it was a little scary. And so I don't know if we would have traveled up there before or how much that happened. But I do know this because this comes from our stories as well. The Stilicum people did not have a tradition for offensive war te techniques. We, we didn't have war councils. We didn't have places where we got together and figured out here's the strategy to go and attack somebody. That's just not what happened. But we did have defensive uh, tactics that we used because traditionally, we know them as coming from the north, but there were tribes that came down from the north, probably even further than Vancouver Island. I'm thinking it probably was, but it could have been them guys. <laughs> but they came down here and they stole people from the Puget Sound. They took them as slaves. There, there were threats of people being cannibals up there in that part of the world as well. And so, so what would you do? So they, the plan was, we just run off and hide. That was the plan. So, and, and it, it didn't make it hard because when those canoes came across the water, it sounded like this. You stroke your paddle. This, this one doesn't work with you. I'm gonna grab the other one. <laughs> you stroke your paddle in the water and then that one didn't go work. And then you hit the side of the canoe at the same time. So it was like this, bang, bang bang and you heard that coming across the water here they come here come here come the, the guys from up north that are going to steal people let's run and hide and so they did not everybody right uh they could grab the little kids and take them off with them some people may have been injured and they couldn't walk or whatever they could stay in the longhouse and the old people could stay in the longhouse too why because they didn't want the old people and the injured people the rest of the people were hiding in the woods and, and most of the time you got away. So what was the relationship like? It was not necessarily positive, but we did have trading. I love this because, you know, the symbol that has come to, to represent the Silicon tribe and the Silicon tribal cultural center, this is actually a whalebone club, uh, which would have been traditionally used as a war club uh, but became a status symbol of, a, of an early leader of the Silicon tribe uh, that was carried by a Silicon tribal leader. And uh, whalebone clubs, we didn't carve whalebone clubs here. So that was something that was traded in, maybe multiple trades to get it here to, to, to Stilicum. But, uh, but yeah, there was a relationship definitely because trading took place. And, but our art, our language, everything else was different. Thank you. And, I, and that is all of the questions we have. So I'll hand